course, with the huge upsurge in popularity of tablets and even smarter smartphones, much of what Grant was describing will be done on mobile devices. In fact, a huge part of the digital health revolution involves mobile, literally having your health information and tools to keep you well at your fingertips. Our final session of the day explores what new, what's new and what's next in the mobile space, including some fresh insights on how mobile may be able to help us finally deal with some of these chronic inefficiencies in the healthcare system. Is that a big question for you guys? <laughs> and how providers, employers, and tech companies are bringing new ideas to the table to intelligently evolve this fast-moving world of mobile health. Let me introduce our fantastic moderator, Dr. Daniel Kraft. Daniel is a Stanford and Harvard-trained physician, scientist, entrepreneur, inventor, and innovator with over 20 years of clinical biomedical research and innovation experience. His expertise and multidisciplinary experiences has led him to chair the medicine track at Singularity University in Silicon Valley and serve as the executive director and curator for Future Med, focused on leveraging exponential technologies in health and medicine over the next decade. Please look at the printed agenda to see the rest of all of his accomplishments. <laughs> if Daniel can't help us figure this out, I'm not sure who can. And he'll introduce these great panelists. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. So uh, it's great to be here. I'm a physician, and my first time at CES, so it's a little overwhelming. Um, but uh, I'm honored to uh, chair this panel, where we'll look at is mobile uh, making us healthier. And just as a, a bit of an interlude, I think you'll find now that there's a healthcare section, digital health section downstairs, that uh, many people are coming to healthcare from the first time from all sorts of different fields. I would bet many of you in the room uh, wouldn't have guessed you'd been in, in the healthcare space a few years ago. And many of these fields are obviously moving very, very quickly. Um, and one of the big opportunities, obviously, it's been spoken about at several of the panels today, is to get away from the realm of, of sort of pay for fee-for-service uh, uh, medicine where we're putting in stents or paid to do biopsies, sort of the era of um, what I call re uh, reimbursement-based medicine, and get to this world of evidence-based medicine and shift the curve to the left, where we know if we spend more of our resources energy, gamification, et cetera, uh, we can make a huge difference on lowering the, the huge burden of healthcare costs that are coming downstream. So, and, to, and many of the technologies, particularly mobile, have the opportunity to move this curve to the left. Many of these technologies are obviously on this exponential realm. Um, we heard uh, this morning from Life Technologies about their now $1,000 genome that's dropped at double the rate of Moore's Law in terms of price and performance, and many of these things are actually crossing and ama enabling mobile technologies from the technologies we'll hear about, like the, the Fitbit and others are, that have shrunk, shrunk things at an amazing rate uh, and brought them to a price point that every consumer can mostly afford. afford. So exponentials are increasingly important to understand, and I think I would challenge the audience to think about where will the next technologies, let's say the iPad 3 and 4, uh, or the, some of the devices we'll hear about, what can they do in a couple years based on these trends? Um, so many things are getting faster, smaller, cheaper and better, um, and across the board, these can be leveraged into healthcare. Obviously, I think the example we're all most familiar with in the mobile space is the phone. That used to be really cool. <laughs> you know, the next movie just came out, so it hasn't been that long ago that, that, that uh, Mike was on the beach with that phone. And clearly now, the, the, the mobile phone as our mobile computing device is, is making huge strides. I would argue if you still had the iPhone 1, you'd find that kludgy and old and only a few apps. We're now at over 17,000 different apps that are health-related in the iPhone and Android stores. And they're not just, for again, for, uh, for the consumer or the patient. They're being used as education devices in medical school. Every medical student at Stanford, where I'm based, gets an, an iPad on day one. And so those tablets are, are certainly changing medicine um, as educational platforms. Uh, as mentioned, I sort of had a fun hat to wear during the summer. I'd share the medicine track at a new program based at NASA Ames in Silicon Valley called Singularity University. It really focuses on taking people out of their normal domains and cross-training them. It was co-founded by Ray Kurzweil, the well-known inventor and futurist, Peter Diamandis, a physician who started the XPRIZE. And, uh, and what we do is take folks from across different fields in AI, robotics, nanotech, biotechnology, medicine, um, space, energy, computing, and look at where things are heading, particularly in how they can be leveraged together to address major problems, whether it's pandemic disease, for example, or poverty or obesity. Um, we also have one-week programs that some of you might be interested including a program coming up again uh, next month called Future Med, which I chair, along with Robin Farman Farming in the back, which particularly is looking at healthcare and all these convergent technologies coming together from mobile to stem cells to artificial intelligence. Um, so 
briefly, again, mobile is exploding, um, and the number of apps are exploding. And I think one of the interesting things we've, we're seeing here this year, in particular, is the integration of devices and mobile and the ability to communicate to the cloud and layer on things like artificial intelligence. You, you heard from one of the founders of Aga Matrix earlier, and they just got this finally FDA approved uh, in the United States, and the ability now to collect mobile data, see it, in, uh, gain inference from, from that, and share that with yourself and your clinical team is increasingly important. And this whole slew of devices, often in the consumer realm, has been uh, summarized in the field of quantified self. It was a small movement in the Bay Area, and now there are chapters around the, around the world, um, starting out sort of like uh, with the early Apple pioneers in the garage, making small devices that now are, are crossing the spectrum. Uh, and you see many of these, many of them are here. And the challenges we'll talk about in the panel is how to bring these together and make them not just data, but actionable intelligence. And clearly now, as we imagine, and you heard maybe yesterday, uh, the era of the tricorder is uh, becoming potentially a reality. Uh, Qualcomm announced a $10 million uh, X prize uh, for uh, essentially a tricorder to enhance and essentially give the power of a panel of physicians at the point in, in the home. So be looking for that prize, and, and maybe some of you will be competing in that. So in summary, from my perspective as a clinician and innovator, I see mobile really starting to empower the individual um, in many ways that we've heard about today, enabling the clinician uh, potentially start gaining insight from the data and the information, not just the data that's being provided by mobile, and to improve a whole realm of, of technologies from the way we do clinical trials, the way we can track uh, particular diseases, chronic diseases, and importantly, prevent things. I think, from my view, uh, we can enhance uh, uh, wellness and uh, be very pre preventative through these. So with that, um, I'll introduce um, our panel, and, and we're going to hear from each of them briefly and then mix it up, and hopefully with the audience as well. Um, so our first uh, panelist is James Park, who's uh, co-founder of Fitbit, perhaps probably the best-known consumer device, wellness device that I've been using for a couple of years. And um, they've had some exciting developments and announcements even here, and I'll let, I'll let uh, James take it from here. So James. Uh, as Daniel mentioned, I'm CEO and co-founder of Fitbit. Uh, Fitbit was founded in 2007 with the vision of using data and sensors to try to motivate people to live healthier lives. And just to give you an idea of what the device is, it's a tiny wearable wireless sensor. You can wear it in your pocket. A lot of our uh, female users clip it to their bra. Um, it's very compact. It tracks your daily steps, uh, calories, distance, and if worn at night, it also tracks your uh, uh, sleep activity as well. Um, you can wear it in a variety of different uh, positions. It fits seamlessly into your lifestyle. Uh, at night, you can wear it on your wrist. And all the data that's collected by the Fitbit is wirelessly transmitted to a base station. So anytime you walk between 20 to 25 feet, all that data gets uploaded to Fitbit.com. On the website, we try to give people a comprehensive dashboard of their health so they can see how many steps they've walked, distance, uh, win badges for various accomplishments if they've walked 20,000 steps a day, 25,000 steps a day, et cetera. In fact, um, it's, it's a pretty fairly addictive part of our site. Um, you know, just recently, we've, I had a 62-year-old woman write in saying that you know, she had been trying for weeks to get the 35,000 a day step badge, which if you try to walk 35,000 steps a day, it's, it's really insane. I was kind of worried for her. Um, I don't think I've ever hit 35,000 steps a day. It's really hard. Um, you can see your, your daily activity minute by minute over the course of a day. Um, at night, uh, you start to see very interesting things about your sleep patterns as well. So we tell you when you fell asleep, um, how long you slept, how many times you woke up throughout the night. And we've had a lot of users, and again, this is not a, a medical device, but we've had a lot of users who've worn the Fitbit said that, hey, the Fitbit told me that I've woken up 45 or 50 times a night, but I don't remember any of those. Um, they go to the doctor, they show the results, the doctor refers them to a sleep lab, and lo and behold, they have some sort of issue, and they get a CPAP machine, and you know, things are great. Um, we try to use a lot of motivational elements uh, on the website. Right now, I would say that we're still in the infancy. Uh, we have a lot of leaderboards where friends and family can compete in a variety of different activity metrics, like who's walked the most steps for the week, uh, distance, calories, et cetera. You can win uh, daily badges, cumulative badges. I think um, with, our, with our new Ultra device, you can actually count the number of floors you've climbed as well. It has an altimeter built in. And you know, our leading users right now, after three months, have climbed about uh, 8,000 floors. Um, so uh, a lot of insane climbers. 
Um, all this data is accessible on the web and on our mobile apps as well. We have a native app, uh, iPhone app, and an Android app coming out soon. Uh, user engagement is really intense on Fitbit. Um, our users get rapidly addicted to the device. You know, almost two thirds of our users log in at least once a day. Um, and I have to say that about 14 to 17% log in over seven times a day. So they're constantly clicking on that dashboard. And what we've seen is for users who are sedentary and define sedentary as walking about two to 3,000 steps a day, when they start using their Fitbit, uh, they, you know, within a matter of weeks are about 43% more active. Um, you know, our story is not just about consumers as well. We are a very popular selling device. I think we're the number two and three pedometer on Amazon, one of the top 50 selling products in the entire health and personal uh, care category on Amazon, along with diapers and you know, razor blades and all that. Uh, but there's a lot of companies who also see the benefit in using sensors and devices to lower their own healthcare costs. So this is a sampling of some of the companies who are using the Fitbit in pretty large deployments um, across their company. Great. Thanks. So um, I'm going to count my steps across the stage. It's fun. And it, it's, it's fun because you have one uh, and you want to like get to 10,000 steps. One of the things you didn't mention, that little flower that grows up, you can kind of set goals. And sometimes, you know, you'll climb the extra set of stairs, you'll take the longer walk than usual to hit your goal. And those little small changes make a big difference. Um, our next speaker is um, actually uh, going to switch over um, to the Prezi. Great. Is the um, uh, CEO of MedHelp, uh, which has a, a plethora of really interesting uh, apps uh, on mul multiple platforms. And I, I think it's another example of someone who moved from a different world, I think the financial world, uh, to make a big impact in health. So um, let's hear from John D'Souza from MedHelp. Thank you. I'm the CEO of MedHelp, and, and uh, we're the largest online health community and leading provider of uh, mobile and online health applications. Now, there are a lot of sites online that give you health information that tell you about diabetes, what asthma is, or any of the other conditions. But what we've done is we focus on how does it apply to you. We focus on delivering personalized health information so that if you find out you're pregnant and that you have another condition, diabetes or some other one, how does it apply to you? So we built a full pl uh, platform to deliver that. And the way we do it is through three different things. Uh, we have communities on the site, we have uh, experts, and we have data. Now, on the communities, we connect people. We have 12 million monthly users coming into a site and connecting around conditions. Uh, we have experts. We work with many of the top hospitals. We have seven of the top 10, all the Johns Hopkins, Cleveland Clinic, Mass General, Harvard, where you can go through and actually ask your personal questions to the doctors for free, a very unique resource on the site. Uh, but I'm not going to focus on those. If you want to talk about that, I'm happy to talk about them later. I'm just going to focus on the data aspect. So what got us into the data aspect is we went to our users and a lot of interest around PHRs. And so we asked our users, uh, you know, are you interested in PHRs? What can we deliver to you? And we got back this resounding message, you know, we're actually not interested in PHRs. So we came back and go, okay, that's not a very compelling uh, value proposition. What they wanted instead is they said, there are conditions that we care about, and can you help us with those conditions? So what we did is we worked with them and with our doctors to create a full suite of online health applications uh, across uh, about 50 different conditions. Now, all these are connected with each other, and you can go through and, and use them. Uh, but for example, if you go through and track your pain, you can go through and track location intensity of pain, and then go back to your doctor and play it back to your doctor like video. And the doctor can very quickly see what has happened to your pain over the time. Or if you're going through and tracking, say, diabetes, you track your diabetes, and we'll actually give you these dashboards that you can take your doctor to again tell them what's, uh, what's happening out there. What's interesting is on the back end of this, all this data goes back in and it feeds into a PHR. So our first realization is that you know, PHR is not what people want, but it's the outcome of doing what they want. And so we, we went through and did that. So after going through and doing this, is, I'd like to tell the quick stories. I went over to, on a trip to India, and when I was in India, I took a rickshaw and asked the, the you know, person, the driver asked me what I did. I said I work at a company called MedHelp. He goes, yeah, you're a very nice site. I go, really? <laughs> I go, what do you mean? And he goes, yeah, yeah I, I use it all the time for my phone. So he showed me. So he goes, pulls the rickshaw over, shows me how he accesses the phone from the, the site. And that was a you know, big revelation. So I go back to the company and I tell everybody, you know, we've got to go and start doing a mobile optimized site here. And they were all skeptical. They go, yeah, you go do a trip to India and come back with these great ideas. Uh, but we went through and we did the, and this is a, a few years ago, we went through and did a mobile app and the version of the site. And our site started, uh, traffic started growing very rapidly. But the data entry grew exponentially. 
So with that, we went through and we started building a full suite of, uh, of condition-specific applications across both the iPhone and Android platform. And uh, there's a lot of different applications there, but there's some very important learnings. One is for us, the applications have to be functional. And this is a, a sleep app that you go through. You use it as an alarm clock. And what it does after a while, it shows your sleep patterns. But then you can go through and enter your medications, caffeine, exercise, and you start seeing the correlations with that in the sleep. The second thing is they need to be medically relevant. So we're actually working with all the doctors to go through and give you apps that actually mean stuff to doctors. So you go through, it tells you this is a mental health app. It tracks all, again, medications, what's influencing it, so you can see how effective it is. The third thing is the apps have to be engaging. So this is a pregnancy app. It gives you all of the pregnancy information. It, it tracks all the way to symptoms. But it has a great baby bum calorie. And you know what? When, it's incredible how that brings people back. They take the pictures. They, we have competitions. They choose the top baby bumps. But in reality, if people don't use this, it's completely useless. So you have to find out what it is that gets them engaged to come back, because then you can get the information that's medically relevant to the doctors. The other thing we learned also very quickly is that you have to be cross-platform. So this is, uh, this is our uh, My Diet Diary. You can track your exercise, fitness. Uh, you can take pictures of your foods, scan foods in. Uh, but you can also access the data in any of these apps from multiple platforms. So this is the same data accessing from a Chrome app. And what we found out very quickly is the way people use the different applications or the platforms is very different. An iPhone user is actually different from an Android user, and we've gone through and sort of done the, the differences with those. Uh, <clears throat> on the back end of this is a lot of data. And the number one thing on our side is people want to know is, am I normal? How does my data compare to a, a, a comparable peer set? So we let people go through, find comparable peer sets, and compare their data to those people. We're also able to get great health insights, and we've published multiple uh, uh, papers with the hospitals. Uh, this is all the pregnancy symptoms for every, for every week of pregnancy. And they didn't have accurate symptoms for the first two weeks of pregnancy, but we could retroactively go back into the, uh, into the ovulation calendars and, and get that data. So you know, this is really powerful. And I, like I was saying, I went back home and told my wife, you know what's incredible? Just by looking at the changes in symptoms, you know, we can tell when a woman's pregnant before she knows it. And she looked at me and goes, you know, only a guy could say that. <laughs> I didn't get much credit for that. Uh, and this, we can also take the data and aggregate it. We can aggregate it on a local, regional, and national level. What's incredible with this is if you look across the country, on average, people exercise 44 minutes a week. So when, on a few weeks ago in NPR, they were talking about to get sustained weight loss, you need to exercise for 60 minutes a day for six uh, days. Nobody's close to that. So we need to say if people exercise 10 minutes a day every day, they're crushing the average. They're doing much better than everybody else. And then finally, the number one thing that people want to go through on the site is connect with doctors. And we're doing two things. One, we're taking the data on our site and giving doctors uh, a view on it. And when you talk to doctors, they say we have even less interest in PHRs than, than you know, patients do. You know, we put this great information in there. But for them, it's a liability. You show them a huge PHR, there's too much data in them, they have no interest. But what we do is they say, if you can filter that data to what's medically relevant and uh, filtered for our specialty, we actually care about it. So we go through, this is a, a view where we take it, show them what, what they can act on. We can do a second phase, actually, where we pull out the data from the uh, EMR that's relevant to the patient and let them leave the hospital with it. One last thing I'm going to touch on uh, is just the connected devices. Uh, with the platform, we have a lot of different devices pulling in. We connect with the, fitting, uh, with the Fitbit, with the Zero, with the, the withering scales and all. We can pull all that in. You can track it on our side, bring that data in. What we care about is how do you look at it from a condition. So for example, if you look at child development, you can go into child development and pull the data in from different devices, from different, uh, uh, from different uh, mobile apps, and then look at all of it from, uh, from a view of a condition as opposed to from the device or the, uh, or the data. And then we'll give you views of it, uh, views that the doctor can look at, and as well give you smart alerts on it. So that's a lot of in terms of what we do. Uh, you can go to medhelp.org and get a good, quick preview. Thank you. Terrific. And I, and I would say from the perspective of a physician, those sorts of apps, when we take them from being pure consumer and tying to the clinician, can start giving you those feedback loops. So I want to find out what my patient's blood glucose or blood pressures are doing. Those things can be very valuable in, in tuning things up. So uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Blood, uh, Bud Flagstad, who's the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at United Health Group. And you might notice downstairs that United Health Group has a huge presence here. And I think it's really indicative of uh, the importance of now particularly getting in the big healthcare organizations and, and payers into this. So Bud's going to give us his perspective. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Hi, I'm Bud Flagstad. Um, we're new to CES in a big way. Hopefully you got a chance to see our booth. Uh, really excited about being part of this. Can you guys hear me okay? Because I don't want to stand behind the podium. 
I want to keep moving because I have a Fitbit on and I want to play cards. So I have to get to my 10,000 steps or I'm going to be in trouble. <clears throat> Funny story, yesterday I walked 22,000 steps with my Fitbit. Um, that is why I have these shoes on, because I was wearing dress shoes yesterday. And I got to tell you, I had to crawl to my room uh, last night. And so I said, I got to wear these shoes. It's going to look real cool on stage. So here I am. Um, so United Health Group, I just want to kind of give you an awareness of who we are. Uh, United Health Group has two companies, Optum and United Healthcare. And it's very important to kind of talk about both of them because they're all, both very different, but they work together. Optum Health is our health services company. Great company, they've got a lot of great offerings that I hope you'll learn about if you come to our booth, I, I hope you do. And they've got a great solution that I'm gonna show you a little bit about called Optimize Me. United Healthcare is our benefits business. Together we serve 78 million Americans in the United States with their healthcare, they trust us in that and that's really important to us. In addition to that, we have 730,000 physicians in our network and over 5,000 hospitals that we work with. So a really relevant group of folks that we work with and we really like to partner with. So let me move on to some slides. Um, that's boring. Okay, so on average, Americans spend 2.7 hours a day socializing on their mobile device. So think about that, and I want to bring that into this discussion as well. Not only do we need to collect the, the data, but we have to figure out how to make it a social interaction with our members. So in my own personal case, we're doing a, um, so, so I work in the innovation and R&D team at United, and we try experiments on ourselves. And uh, some of them go really well, and some of them go very interesting. Right now, I'm working on one called Weight Loss in a Box. Um, and it's a social solution using the Fitbit, um, Optimize Me, our application that I'm going to show you, and then Fit, uh, uh, Lose It on top of the Why Things scale as well. So we're tying all this stuff together. But most importantly for me is it's social. I'm working with my coworkers. They're, they're urging me to move forward. They're urging me to do better. I've lost 15 pounds in less than a week and a half. For me, that's a big deal. So thank you. Um, and, and Daniel's question is, or the, the, the question about the discussion here is mobile making us healthier. Well, in my own personal case, I happen to be a type 2 diabetic, diagnosed in 2007, and I started using the Philips Direct Life back then when my A1Cs were real high, and I used that device to actually understand how much I was exercising, and it helped me move my A1C down from in the 9s, high 8s, low, low 9s, back down into the 6s. So it was absolutely helpful for me. We're, we're learning more and more from more and more studies. We're doing studies ourselves, so I think there's a lot of value in it. But again, the social component to me is a really important part. 91% of mobile internet access is there for socializing. Think about that. Even on your computers, it's only 79%, but we're all using our phones to check Facebook. How many people have sent pictures to Facebook of st cool stuff they've seen at CES? Yeah, come on, more you gotta be involved in that. Um, and, and we think mobile is extending the, the individual's reach. And we have great solutions in the background, like our eSync, um, um, engine is part of Optum Solutions, ultimately allowing us to drive data from the Fitbit and others in there to help people make healthier choices, giving them the information to understand better about how they can make healthier choices for themselves. Uh, and the social interaction, again, have I said social enough? That's how important we think it is to really make these things stick. And for us, social and what you heard from Grant probably before us, tremendously valuable in our opinion. And we're adding gamification as well. You know, from our perspective, what consumers do need from, from our, us is health achievement. So that came out of a, uh, uh, a run through New York, and I didn't actually run. And I only run if something's chasing me and it's bigger than me. But uh, in this case, it was me and my team, and we were doing some innovation stuff, and we were earning badges on Foursquare. And it became a competition to see who had the most mayorships and the most badges. And so we would walk, and I walked 27,000 steps thanks to my previous version of the Fitbit and bought new shoes the next day. Um, but, but I achieved badges, and it's a continued competition with my team. So we've built badges into Optimize Me to help people achieve goals, and we believe that's very important for health achievement. On top of that, we think system navigation is really important. So we're now building an application for our benefits side of the business to help people find things in healthcare easier. It's a little confusing out there, right? Our goal is to really simplify that and create what one of our customers, our big, big customers, said, I need a GPS for healthcare. And so we built Health for Me, which will be done at the end of January, um, and that's going to help our members get navigating through uh, the health system. And again, across the bottom, you see social. You're going to see more and more social in our business. Really, really important. Um, the health achievement optimized me. We've integrated with Fitbit. Uh, we're working with Why Things and others, and uh, certainly partnering with Lose It as well. We think they have a tremendous platform to work with. So we as a company are working with them and are making commitments to work with them. So last but not least, our friends uh, Lose It, certainly 7 million pounds of body weight. I feel like I've done that in my lifetime. Um, 
CareSpeak, another partner of ours that we're working diligently with to take advantage of as part of our overall solution. And, and um, wireless enabled ICDs and CRTs have mortality rate and clinical trial of 100,000 patients. We think that's really important data to share. So um, that's United Health Group in a nutshell. I hope you come by our booth um, and I hope you enjoy what you see. Thank you. So we've heard about some consumer tech devices, apps that tie them together, some of the payers getting involved in this. Finally, I think there's an opportunity um, to pull all together almost uh, uh, the, the whole backbone. Um, we heard from Ford, I think, during the keynote. I often make the analogy it was from Don Jones at Qualcomm about the OnStar <coughs> for the body. All these pieces integrating together, have that check engine light come on, that can make the whole thing work uh, much more effectively. And um, uh, Verizon is a company that's really starting to put all the pieces together. And so we're going to hear from um, Scott Kozicki, who's uh, the, uh, from the New Market Development Group at Verizon Wireless. Thanks, Scott. Hello, all. Apparently, if you're uh, at CES, comfy shoes are a requirement. <laughs> I want to start off with a little bit more sober tone um, because I think there's some amazing things that are being done. And clearly, at CES, it's a, it's a great place to see all of this energy and fervor around apps, devices, tools that people can use to better engage with their health, understand their health, uh, and, and act upon it. But the reality is, is that we're in a sorry state in the US when it comes to health. It's incredibly expensive. We spent $2.6 trillion a year on it last year. Mo almost half of that was on just managing chronic illnesses, things like diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, asthma, uh, things that are lifestyle diseases, we like to call them, uh, where you have a choice uh, as to whether that's going to happen to you or not. The other uh, somber thought there is it's incredibly difficult, even still, to get access to quality care. The average wait time to get an appointment with a physician in the US is 20 days. And in some markets, like the East Coast, it's 40 days. So we looked at those two things and we thought, what can we take out of our big red bag of tricks to help improve those things? Not just financially, but from a clinical and uh, health status perspective. So there's been tremendous advance. We've seen all these great apps. We've, uh, the, the show is full of amazing things, uh, advances in terms of ways that people can engage with their health. We all know that uh, technology has rapidly uh, advanced the state of the art in the ER, in, in clinical settings to help us do amazing things that were just un, unthinkable 10, 15, 20 years ago. But the way that we manage chronic illness and the way that we engage around it has not kept pace at all. Uh, we're still pretty much stuck with uh, something happens to me, I go to the ER, and uh, I, I rapidly uh, decompose uh, from, the, from a, a state of being pre-diabetic or pre-chronic to uh, suffering from multiple chronic conditions and not having a very good quality of life in, in, in the meantime. Our approach to this is we are the stage that these kinds of folks and, and people out there in the audience know, most likely will, can stand on. So Verizon as a company is one of the best in the world at moving the right piece of information to the right person at the right time wherever they're at. The platforms that we're building around mobile health are to enable just that. So I want Fitbit and a bunch of other devices to work with Bud's programs. Bud doesn't necessarily want to build the infrastructure to not only reach out to all those sensor devices, normalize that data, uh, and put it into a very secure cloud-based infrastructure. Bud's got more important things to do. He's focused on the interaction and the engagement experience of his members. So that's where Verizon comes in. We'll enable those, that conduit of information to go back and forth to the various stakeholders in a secure way uh, across uh, one of the best networks in the world. So that starts with you know, letting people, uh, the physician and the patient, develop a personalized care plan for their particular situation, enabling video consultations between those stakeholders, uh, using remote devices, a, a smartphone or a tablet, gathering all of the telemetry that comes off the, that person's uh, uh, meters around them and their activity, right? We see that just pedometers can be uh, an, an effective tool in helping people to understand how much activity they're getting, how much exercise they're getting, how much sleep they're getting, but build a, a sort of a, a profile or a picture around you of what is it that you're doing 
uh, and then that, that enables you to understand the choices you're making on a daily basis, and that's what's gonna, that's really where your health is, is the choices that you make all day long around taking the stairs versus the elevator. What am I gonna eat versus not eat? Um, gathering all that information uh, with the devices and being able to reflect it back to the member or, or the participant and their care team, their doctor, their care manager, nurse. And we're stuck, there we go. Um, so I mentioned that you know, what we really bring uh, is the ability to move that information back and forth. I'm giving the member and the clinician tools to interact with that information, and I'm moving it through a you know, world-class, uh, secure, cloud-based infrastructure so that they don't have to worry about uh, is it always gonna be available? Is it always gonna be on? Am I, am I going to be able to get that data where I need to? And putting it into a context that each of the stakeholders can act on it, right? I don't necessarily want to take all of my glucose readings to my doctor on a quarterly basis and say, look, this is what I've been doing for the last 90 days. What the doctor really cares about is, have I had any adverse uh, events or, or impacts? And then where am I trending relative to my care plan? Am I doing better towards my care plan or do I need a little bit more nudging, coaching, assistance to get to those goals? So it's not just about moving the, a piece of data from point A to point B, it's also reflecting that or refactoring it in a way that that person, that stakeholder can act on it. And that's really what we're focused on with our platforms. I'll give you a, a, an example. Disease management is a, is a not new concept, but in terms of mobile, I think it can be very, very powerful. I talked about the incredible cost of chronic illness on our, our economy and our society in general. Well, using all these devices, if I'm a diabetic or I, I suffer from hypertension, I can get a reminder on my phone in the morning, hey, make sure you weigh yourself. Make sure you check your glucose before breakfast. Make sure you take your medication. Uh, and then those, those devices are gonna help me verify that I did those things. That goes back into the platform. If there's any adverse issues there, if I get a low blood glu glu glucose, um, I can notify my, my care manager nurse immediately. So she knows that out of the several hundred people that she's responsible for, I'm gonna float to the top. And she knows that I, she needs to intervene and coach with me more than the guy who did take his medication and did uh, 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 weigh himself that morning. And that feedback loop moves back and forth so that uh, I get a better understanding as the patient of how are my choices impacting my health and I'm getting the, the appropriate um, attention and intervention from uh, my care managers and other stakeholders when I need it. It's not a burden to me, it comes when it's appropriate. So that's just one use case of, of what we're doing for digital care management. So the outcomes are, are pretty self-explanatory. The, the key here is engagement, understanding from, from an individual perspective. What are the choices that I'm, I'm doing? How are they impacting me? Now I can see the gauges moving as I'm making choices. And uh, that will lower costs. Healthier people cost less. Uh, and ultimately, that's gonna drive better care because the other person that's participating in that, the provider side of that, is going to be able to, to put forth the right effort, the right uh, energy, uh, where they can make an impact on modifying or changing my behavior uh, through moving all that data back and forth. So that's really where, where Verizon is focused on this. And that's it. Thanks. Great, thanks. <clears throat> So mobile is still relatively a young space, and I think uh, many people are looking to move into it. Um, I'm hoping maybe we could share some sort of uh, war stories and lessons learned. What are some um, maybe uh, distinctions that um, being in the realm uh, as sort of early players uh, you've taken away? And uh, so, you know, James, you guys just announced a new scale uh, as well, and maybe what did you put into that that you didn't put into Fitbit first? So uh, we just announced the ARIA Wi-Fi Smart Scale, um, and that's added to our ecosystem. So not only people can track their activity and sleep, but also their weight and body fat in one dashboard. And I think you know some of the, the main things we took away in development of the, the scale is, one, making the setup process of the device extremely simple. I think um, there's a lot of people out there um, who just run into problems with devices that are too complicated. Um, the second issue is, you know, the issue of how do you get this data uh, up to a service that's, you know, residing in the cloud or hosted somewhere. Um, with the original Fitbit, you know, there's a base station that's plugged into your computer, but, you know, it works well, but it's not as seamless as we would like it to be. So with Wi-Fi, we're able to directly connect, you know, to our service, to your home Wi-Fi network. 
and that's actually you know one of the one of the biggest things we worry about with every product we we um, we have planned is how do we get that data up to the cloud and it's not easy there's a lot of trade-offs with Wi-Fi you know it's it's simple but it burns a lot of power which in more space or restraint resource constrained devices you know you just you just can't tolerate John lessons learned you know, for us, we're very user-centric, and so we always spend time going back to the users. And uh, we did a great session where we spent time with the users and, and asked them for feedback on all these apps that we've developed and, and got a few things back. One which was great, very insightful is uh, a user who stopped using one device, and she said she was using it for tracking and running, uh, got injured, and then started swimming. And she said, when I was swimming, my avatar on the site started dying because I wasn't running. And she goes, look, I'm working my butt off swimming, but my avatar is dying. I hate this device. <laughs> so she said, look, I'm not one-dimensional. And you have to realize health is not a one-dimensional product, and you need to work them across dimensions. The same thing that they got back to us is, don't make me work. You know, there's often the belief in health that, look, you're sick. You should be willing to work. It's your health. And consistently, you go, don't make me work. Make it easy. The third one that they came back to is, speak my language. You know, communicate to me in a way that's very easy for me to understand it. Because often you get somebody, you do a cancer app, and you put all these terms in. And this woman was saying, look, you know, I, I found out I have breast cancer. And the first thing to go is, you know, metastasize. And she goes, I don't know what that word means. And if I don't understand it, how am I going to communicate with my family? And she goes, why can't you guys just speak to me in a language I understand? I'm si it's, it's bad enough that I'm sick. And then you teach me a new language on top. So, so that's the third. So I think as you go through this, there's a lot you can learn from the users because you know, they know what they want. And if you start off with that, you end up with, uh, with apps that are a lot more useful to them. Bud, you've been trying some of these out in your organization and with your participants. What's, what's uh, absolutely. And you know, uh, well, well, first off, um, making it simple to use was really important. Aggregating the data from multiple services into a single point for people so they aren't logging into six different places. And so our integration of the Fitbit or solutions has been a fantastic add to the Optimize Me platform, which we shipped yesterday. So if you have an iPhone, please download it and try it out. Give us your feedback. We will take it and we'll make it better for sure. Um, and, and then, the, again, I'll harp on it a little bit, but the social component, how valuable that has become for us to really stay on top of things and to, to create cool achievements. And when we watch um, on Optimize Me 1.0, uh, groups of three people getting together to do challenges, significantly more successful than somebody doing it by themselves. And, and, and the unique stuff that we learn from the challenges that people create, and we curate those, so you can't create a drinking game uh, in the Optimize Me app. Um, but, but, but we learn a ton from consumers, which is why we're here. And, 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 and really learning and feeding that back into the next design of Optimize Me 2.0. For a company who spent a lot of time selling directly to you know, employers, it's really important for us to really understand what the consumers want. So. And you're, you're very much looking, though, uh, at sort of the ROI a lot from a lot of these things. One of the things, the question from the panel is, you know, is, uh, is this making us healthier? Right. Um, there's obviously some things that are weight, hemoglobin A1C. Is there any other, other particular metrics from, from your sort of perspective? You know, right now, Daniel, those are the things we're focusing on. We're trying to understand the consumers. It's so early. Um, and I think what's going to, so I'm, I'm very fortunate to be in a team where I don't get pushed for ROI right away, and we get to build these things and try them and learn. And uh, that's the fantastic part about my job, and I, I believe I have the best job at the company, uh, to really test those things out, and, and we'll learn from them. And then we'll, we'll fail fast, or we'll move forward, and we'll partner with great companies like these to, to help us get better. So. Verizon. Is there, is there, you want to know? <laughs> can you hear me now? Um, is there? Is, <laughs> no, I mean, well, you've got a, sometimes critical uh, efficacy. Sometimes, if it's a uh, if something's communicating directly to a hospital or physician, it's, there's a, a backbone that's critical. Are there sort of other lessons that you've learned that you're going to be putting your next generation systems or surprises that have come about in the mobile space? Well, to address that, I mean, we you know we support a lot of mission critical systems in a lot of different industries, in government and finance and in healthcare. Uh, so we have a lot of legacy uh, experience in doing that, and we're really just sort of steering it and applying it to these kinds of applications and making sure we package it in a way where, you know, healthcare services can understand it and be able to pull that off the shelf, quickly deploy it, and get value out of it. Um, the thing that I think pleases me the most here, the answer to that question is design matters, right? Usability matters. Being able to iterate with customers around how do they use the devices, um, and fine-tuning and tweaking them to optimize that experience is really important. Uh, it's not fun having a chronic illness, right? You're already starting from less than zero interest. I don't want to know about all the bad things that I have to deal with. 
all the hard choices, all the hard work I got to deal with if I have a chronic illness. So I'm starting from a very negative place. How do you move that to a place where it's positive, where it's engaging, where it's fun even? Uh, that, that's difficult and it requires good design. So it's great that you know, people like people that are on this panel and I hear this constantly, that people really focus on uh, uh, the optimizing the experience. And optimizing, I think from, um, we know that there are some personality types, we know the different genetic types. Eric Tobel mentioned the individualization of personalized medicine. I, I think there's a, an opportunity to start individualizing the dashboards and the patterns and the rewards, the, the carrots and the sticks are gonna be different from individuals. Different people use badges and people like getting to a flower, other things um, I think can be individualized along those realms. Um, so we're here at a sort of a technology uh, conference. I, maybe I'd pull the panel if it's 2013, 2014, a lot of these trends are, exponential trends are improving, you know, better computing, cheaper accelerometers, et cetera. What would you like to see and what would you think that um, innovators in the audience might help build to amplify your efforts? Uh, so for us actually, I think a lot of the hard work that goes into a big splash at CS goes behind the scenes. Um, so we depend a lot on advancements in sensors, in microcontrollers, uh, radios, uh, manufacturing processes, et cetera. And you know, what we do as a company in our engineering organization is we're constantly scouting for new technologies, looking for the lowest power accelerometers, the lowest power gyroscopes, um, lowest power radios, the most efficient microcontrollers. And um, you know, there's a ton of events, papers, et cetera, published every year. And you know, for us, the rewarding thing is taking advantage of all, the, all that and packaging that into a consumer-friendly format for an event like CES. Mm -hmm. Not that. that makes sense. Yeah. John, I think we do a lot of uh, testing of all the devices with our users, and I'd say the one thing that is a big hindrance continues to be, you know, battery life. Uh, you know, you'll forget your device because you have to put it to recharge, and also I think extension of battery life would be a big uh, boon there. On the flip side, of it, the other thing as well that uh, I think would help us on the data perspective is we carry, we have tremendous amounts of data what people are using. We know that click streams through every single page. There's so much we can do that we need to get much better ways of doing great statistical modeling on what people are doing, because you can do great predictions based on the statistical modeling, uh, you know, based on what they've done, the click patterns, what, what they're using, you can tell a lot about what's gonna happen to our health. I think sort of getting better tools to be able to crunch large data sets is, is gonna be very helpful. And, and obviously the world of artificial intelligence is starting to be applied on top with Siri coming out, obviously, and Watson, and IBM Watson is applying that to this, so there's opportunity to start maybe analyzing that in smarter ways. So, so I agree with everything uh, James and John have said, and you know, I, 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 I have a hobby of driving race cars, and um, um, I enjoy the fact that I can keep an eye on what's going on in my car all the time, oil pressure, temperature. I like to see wearable computing in the future where I can understand when I have a donut as a type two, what happens to my body, and I can actually see the effects as real time as possible on my mobile device, my iPhone, my Android device, and help me make better choices and decisions and tie it back into a back end of big data, uh, much like we have or others have, that help people make a better choice and better understanding. That's, what, that's my hope in the next f future, so. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. I, I think you had a great slide, which was, it showed the old cradle phone. Um, that's really where we're at with all of this. It sounds funny to say that because we're in a, in a conference where we're seeing things that you couldn't even have imagined two or three years ago, and the pace of innovation and, and technology is so rapid, but we're really just at the tip of this new journey, which is allowing this, this, these tools to better allow me to understand what's going on with my body, how my choices affect that, and ultimately all the financial things uh, uh, that go along with that, the productivity that goes along with that. So I'm optimizing my, my choices, my health around uh, those dynamics. We've just begun. I want to open it up to the folks in the, in the crowd here. So maybe come up with the mic and I'll just ask you a quick question while the people are coming up. Um, barriers, I mean, a lot of these things are uh, at the cutting edge. It takes a while for barriers of adoption um, from the clinical side, from regulatory reimbursement, HIPAA, all those sorts of things. Are there sort of barriers you see that really need to start getting knocked down to help enable this? You might have some. Well, reimbursement, of course. Sure. I, think, I think that's the, the big boogeyman in the room. I don't think that will stop the pace, um, it, it may slow it down a little bit in certain quarters of the industry, but it's certainly not gonna stop. There's so much pressure built up right now to try and impact costs, try and reach out and engage with certain populations that it's gonna happen regardless. It's just these old financial models that we have might not necessarily 
accommodate it. Yeah, Medicare, its new mantra is you know better care at lower costs, and now with these new accountable care organizations, you won't have to be you know these will be bundled in because you're going to be rewarded as a hospital or physician care group for keeping people healthy there. So you're going to hand out, you're going to prescribe apps or prescribe Fitbits or scales or MedHelp apps um, because that's going to lead to better outcomes and new reimbursement part follows. Uh, I think another key piece is security. You know, with 78 million Americans in our system at United, it's really important for us to make sure that we secure that data for them and all the data that goes along with it. So that's a really important part for us. Absolutely. Yeah. The other issue too is I think the FDA is is really important, but there does exist a risk of overregulation of these devices and services. And for us especially, um, you know, we're very consumer driven. Um, we're almost a, you know, a web style device company where we're constantly developing new algorithms, pushing them out live to customers in the field. Um, so I think anything that hinders that, you know, could be, could be a huge barrier. And you see a lot of companies talking about actually releasing products in Europe first because it's quicker to get uh, through all the, uh, the requirements out there and then bring it back to the U.S. So I think there's a chance that even though it's developed here, we may we end up uh, being a laggard because people go elsewhere first to, to deploy them. That's, that's already happening, yeah. for sure, for sure. Okay, let's up there. Hi, uh, Ed Bosey, I'm a VP of Innovation at uh, Xerox. Uh, I'm an actuary, I've done work in uh, financial simulation, and currently I'm engaging in uh, research regarding health gaming. And one of the things I'm surprised that I haven't seen is anything in the way of uh, health simulation uh, to uh, uh, the earlier example. So, you know, I'm a current weight, why can't I create an avatar of myself? You know, I, I drink regular Coke, I don't eat any vegetables, and you know, draw, you know, drag my avatar across the timeline and show how I'm getting fatter, I'm getting older, I'm getting diabetes, I'm having my heart attack, and then the tombstone rises up at age 65. You know, why haven't I seen anything in the way of simulation as a means of educating people about what what it means, the decisions that they make now, what it means over time. There actually is some of that. Um, if you look at the MIT Age Lab, uh, they actually have a suit that you can put on and it makes you feel like you're much older. Uh, I don't uh -huh. want to say a particular age, but it, it, it lets you feel how your body would be affected by age and, and by disease. That's also, good. I need something web-based. Uh, that's the, well, that's well, what I'm I was going to mention the Visual MD. Um, also allows a little bit of that, so you, you can kind of change your health status in a real-time way, and it will show you what fat cells look like or what your pancreas looks like uh, in a real-time way, and that, that's a great way to educate Whose product? People. Visual MD. Yeah. That's, okay. One, one element of that is this whole forward-looking feedback loop. So if you want to impact behavioral change, which is really tough, there's a group at Stanford, a, a virtual reality lab that I visited, and you can do a virtual experience, uh, and that can really change your psychology. One of them is basically a virtual mirror. You'll look in the mirror and see what you'll look like, let's say, six months later, if you've lost 15 pounds and stayed on your program, or if you keep smoking and don't change your diet. So having that sort of virtual mirror has already been built in sort of uh, in, in psychologic trial basis and can have huge impacts, as well as that sort of virtual avatars, your friends socially kind of watching. If you tweet your weight, that can be a bit of a mirror. There's a company that's just been launched by the co-founder of uh, Practice Fusion, a free EMR called 100 Plus, I think, and they let you look at what your trends will be as you change your behavior. So that's a bit of a forward-looking mirror. Who is that of, one? I think it's called 100 Plus. Yeah, it is 100 yeah, Chris Plus. Chris Ho. Chris Ho, yeah. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, I'm Andy Tubman. I'm a music therapist and a co-founder of Musical Health Technologies, and uh, we just literally last month came out with an app that promotes healthcare, I mean, health and well-being, uh, everything from speech to executive function uh, through singing. And the question comes to that, I'm looking for our industry. So the majority of discussion today and over the last year I've been getting educated about the mobile, the mobile industry is all about collection, transferring of data. With our app, we do collect data, but it actually has the process and the exercise in the, in the app, through the lines. What other companies do you guys know of that are actually processing it through the lines? When you say processing through lines, can you kind of? So there's some like relaxation apps that actually guide you through relaxation. Our app guides you through a singing process through, uh, that might focus on speech or helping reality orientation with dementia, right? It actually 
provides some of the therapeutic, the therapy. Sure. So the majority of things is about data collection and you know, how to utilize data as opposed to the actual act of. Are there other companies that you guys know of that has to do with the act of with the app? You know, this Baycrest in uh, Canada does a, lot, a set of uh, games for uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, and all that teaches, that goes and actually teaches you. So they, it's a really neat game you play, and it, te it teaches uh, people with Alzheimer's as to how to remember things and uh, different ways of, of dealing with everyday situations. So very neat, very effective. That's Canon? Uh, oh. It's in Canada, a company called Baycrest. Baycrest. Okay, okay. Great. Good afternoon. Uh, Mickey McMahon is from Maya. So um, uh, last year and, and this year, um, the Chief Technology Officer for Health and Human Services, Todd Park, rela helped, helped release about 400 plus data sets that had never been seen before out of Health and Human Services and you know, opendata.gov. And, and he relates it to this notion of uh, when Reagan released GPS, it became a platform. Everyone had mobile apps that had GPS. Uh, when we released uh, NOAA data, we suddenly got Weather Channel and it became a platform from public funded by our taxes. Um, so 400 data sets all the way back to 1900, all available free, lots of new apps coming out of it. My suspicion is in five years we're going to think that's a huge deal and that became a platform for innovation. How many of you guys use those, that new thing that happened in the last year and what do you think the impact of that kind of a platform the same way we got GPS, you know, from, from all those satellites back then. So, so we're definitely using it. Um, I've got a team very specifically assigned to big data. Uh, we've got a giant Natiza box in our lab that we combine and do mashups with the health data. And we're in the early stages of identifying opportunities and building actually a, um, an iPad app to test it out as a, a visualization way. So it's, it's great stuff. And uh, I was at um, Healthcare Innovation Day when Todd announced that. And, uh, I was, the first thing I did was text with my team and said, let's get on this right away. And I'm really excited about some of the opportunities around it, absolutely. And the mashup with our data, I mean, we've got 12 um, petabytes of information in our company. And, and as we start to bring that stuff together uh, with government data, it's going to be fantastic. And as we partner with other groups, we're, we're pretty excited about it. Yeah, we've actually used some of those data sets to create baselines to look at our own population. I mean, one of the things about Verizon is we're one of the largest uh, self-insured employers and we have almost a million lives covered, so we're not just building these tools to bring to market and sell. We, we want to eat our own dog food around us, and we, we see value in it already. So we've used some of that data to baseline and then look at our own populations relative to that, and then we'll be using the tools that I talked about to impact that and see how are we bending those trends. So I, I agree. I think that is seminal in the sense that even if the data itself isn't super useful to us years from now, just the act of training people on how to manage it, how to analyze it, you know, the, the thought of big data, how to, what do we do with it, uh, is good training ground to, for lots of applications that, you know, our, our platforms, all of these tools are gonna cr create exponential amount of data. What do, we, what do we do with that? Another great example is the USDA basic nutritional data for foods. Um, you know, that data set forms the initial core element of a lot of, you know, expensive commercial databases out there. And you know that data powers a lot of the most popular food logging and nutrition apps on the you know in iTunes right now. I would I would probably imagine as you start to crowdsource the data not only from the government but from the individual apps, um, it becomes the the issue of sort of systems biology, systems medicine. We can pull it together. It's not just data. We want it to be actionable information that can then in impact you know a community, the individual, the family. So lo lots of huge opportunity in the space. Um, I've seen, we got the high, time, high sign from Jill. Oh, we got a couple, actually a few more minutes, so we started late. Any more um, burning questions from the audience? My name is Arlene Petrish. I'm with um, EWI Worldwide, a live communications company. I have a question for Mr. Park. I'm wearing my Fitbit. Um, are you going to be um, in incorporating uh, barcode reading of foods with Fitbit like uh, Lucid has, is doing? Um, you know, we're, we're a little less focused on the nutritional aspect just because, you know, we have partnered up with companies like Lucid and MyFitnessPal who, who do it a lot better, um, and we've integrated with them through our API. Um, I'm personally a little skeptical of barcode scanning. I hope that doesn't, you know, discourage you, but I think a lot of our users, um, they don't eat a lot of packaged foods, 
and in the cases where they do, where they're eating prepared meals, um, et cetera, it's fairly easy for them to, to just punch the numbers. But you know, if, if you want to provide a counter opinion, I'd, I'd love to hear it as well after the panel. And, and there is a, pro a proliferation now of these sort of food tracking apps and even the ability, to, we heard from the prior panel about food related technologies. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of bringing mobile to the, to, to the diet industry. And the one uh, thing I'll say quickly on the food tracking, we, we launched this app called Pick Healthy for people who just want to take the pictures of it and then it's back, it crowdsourced on the back end to find out how healthy the food is. So if you feel like doing nothing, I'll just take pictures of your food. It tells you within seconds that all these people tell you, you get the data back. It also allows you to, you can put in what you think it is. It compares it to what they do and gives you honesty points. So if you eat the donut and say it's really healthy and every goes no, you get a negative more honesty points for that. <laughs> <laughs> Great, with that, I think we'll thank the panel and great yes, to be here. Yes, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.